So here's a quick outline of what I'm gonna cover today. First, we're gonna go over scouting and monitoring, and then I'm gonna spend the majority of the time on pest identification, um, diseases, and insects. So to start with a question, does anyone know what scouting is? Um, so just write your thoughts uh, in the chat. And if you don't know what it is, you can just write, I don't know. <laughs> Good. I, it seems everyone who's answering is answering correctly. So scouting is something you probably do every day when you're out in the garden, and it's simply looking at your plants for any signs of potential issues. So obviously this includes signs of insect feeding or diseases, but it's also looking for any other thing that might pose a problem, um, you know, underwatering, overwatering, that kind of stuff. So this is done to detect, detect problems early so that you can decide if some type of action is needed. So for example, if you're out there and you find the early signs of bacterial canker on your tomatoes, you can go out and remove and destroy the infected plants and hopefully limit the spread. It's important when you're scouting to look at your plants regularly. We encourage at least weekly to go out and look at your plants. And it's also important to look at all portions of the plant. <coughs> some, some insects are only found in the lower leaves or diseases might start in the lower leaves. So you Marianne, suddenly you're muted. Sorry. Sorry, that was how that happened. Fault. Oh, <laughs> that was my fault. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I was saying, just make sure you look at all different parts of the plant. You're going to want to look at the stems, uh, the leaves, the lower leaves, the upper leaves, look at the top part of the leaf, the underside of the leaf, look at the fruit. So cover the entire plant. Don't just glance at it. And scouting is also used. Oops, I never advanced my slide, I'm sorry. Um, scouting is also used to determine if the action you took actually worked. So the example of removing the tomato plants that have bacterial canker on it, once you remove those infected plants, do you still see bacterial canker or were you able to slow the spread? Um, so, oops, geez. Sorry about that. Um, some of the tools that are helpful to have, uh, as mentioned yesterday, a field book, Many of the speakers yesterday brought up a field book, write down your observations. It's important to keep track of the date when you observed something, what variety it was on, and specifically what you observed. Was it an insect? Was it a disease? When did it arrive? You, you're gonna think you're gonna remember this, but the seasons kind of blend together and you're gonna forget what variety really worked well for me last year. When did this disease arrive? So it's really important to write down while it's still fresh in your mind, when you're, when you're seeing things out in the field. Um, some other tools to have, a pocket knife is very helpful to have while you're out there to collect any samples or to remove diseased plants. Uh, just make sure that you clean it after you use it so you're not spreading any diseases. Some other tools are um, having plastic bags available to put your samples in and maybe a hand lens to look at really small things like mites or thrips that would be on your, on your leaves. So I want to go into identification now. Um, so I hope you understand how important scouting is so that you can catch issues before they become a problem. But you also have to be able to identify what the issue is so that you can manage it correctly. Not everything that you're going to encounter out there is a pest. You might see an insect out there that's a beneficial, like a ladybug or a minute pirate bug, and you definitely wouldn't want to control for those. You could um, also find insects that just happen to be out there. They're considered incidental, meaning they just landed in your garden, but they're not causing any damage. And again, you wouldn't want to control for those either. You also need to know if something is caused by an abiotic factor or a, a nutrient deficiency or drought. So you want to be able to distinguish, is this a disease or is this some kind of nutrient imbalance? So once you know what it is you have, then you can determine um, what the management is that you're going to need. Uh, you're also going to know what crops may be affected. Uh, when the best time is to control it, what life stage you need to control, whether the pest overwinters or not, um, if there's any beneficials that you can use to control it, and if there are resistant varieties available. So knowing what the pest is will allow you to get all that kind of information. 
So I'm now going to go over disease identification, um, followed by insect identification, and trying to go over all the possible insects and disease pests that you might encounter over a season is um, way too much to cover in 25 minutes. So I decided to just try to give you some tools that will hopefully help you kind of narrow it down um, and hopefully lead you to a potential identification. Um, so we're going to start with disease identification. And for diseases, it's uh, important to understand the disease triangle. I know this was mentioned several times yesterday. There are three main requirements for a disease to be present. Uh, first, you have to have the pathogen. Um, then you have to have a suitable host crop. Uh, this is where resistance can be very important. And finally, you have to have a suitable environment. So you may have the pathogen and the host, but the weather might not be favorable and therefore the disease won't develop. So when you look at this triangle, all three of these circles have to overlap for the disease to occur. If one of them is missing, you're not going to have the disease. Um, disease identification, uh, this can be very difficult just based on symptoms alone. There are several disease symptoms that can look similar to other diseases or to abiotic disorders. Um, so I'm going to go over uh, fungal, bacterial, and viral. And here's just a picture of a fungal disease, a bacterial disease, and a viral disease. So we're going to start with the fungal diseases. About 85% of plant diseases are caused by a fungal pathogen. They can enter through wounds in the plant, but they can also enter directly in through the plant cuticle. And one way to help you determine if what you have is a fungal disease is to take a sample and place it into a moist chamber. So a moist chamber can be as simple as a plastic bag with a moist paper towel and you leave it in there for a day or two and you monitor it to see if you observe any fungal growth. So here you can see a tomato leaf inside the plastic bag. It's, we suspected it to have light blight. So you're gonna observe it to see if you see this white mycelium growing and that would indicate, yes, it was positive for late blight. Um, here are some of the things you might want to look for for bacterial diseases. The lesions are often have kind of a dark greasy or water soaked appearance. The bacteria will enter in through openings or wounds in the plants and they favor wet weather. And a test that you can do for bacterial diseases is this bacterial streaming test. So you take your suspect tissue and you place it into a clear glass of water and you're looking for this uh, bacterial streaming. It's coming out of the, the cup portion. This is not always definitive. Um, not all lesions will stream and there might also be sap coming out. So you're gonna wanna look for other things as well, like the greasy spots, um, yellow halos around the lesions or bacterial ooze, which you can see over here. Um, those are all indicative of bacterial diseases. The viral disease symptoms, they can vary greatly kind of from a mottled look to ring spots or mosaic patterns. Um, viruses are vectored from one plant to another, often by an insect such as an aphid or a thrips or beetles. And there's no easy test for viruses. Uh, if you suspect that you have a virus, you would need to send a sample to a diagnostic lab for confirmation. But a great resource um, to people is your local CCE office. Uh, they can help you with any kind of disease as well as insect identification. So I'm now gonna go over a couple of disease examples. And I'm going to show you some pictures. So this is the upper surface of the leaf. So if you have ideas of what this is, if you can just write it in the chat. If you know specifically what it is, you can write that down. Um, or you can just say whether you think it's a fungal, um, viral, or bacterial disease. So that's the upper surface of the leaf. The second one's the lower surface. And then this is just kind of a close up of that lower surface. So just write down what you think that might be. Fungal, bacterial, viral. Or if you know specifically what it is, you can write that down too. So we got two fungals, a bacterial, a viral, oh, another fungal. All right, so this is cucurbit downy mildew. It is a fungus like oomycete. And you can see from the second and third picture, this kind of down or fuzz on the underside of the leaf. These are the pathogen spores. And you would observe these if you place the leaf into a moist chamber, this would start growing on the underside of the leaf. So it prefers cool, wet weather um, and a living host to survive. It does not overwinter here. It travels up from the south on weather fronts. Um, there are some resistant varieties available. 
that you could plant. And you can also try to plant early to avoid downy mildew because it doesn't appear in New York until, until July. And of course, you'd want to remove any infected plants that you have. So here's our next disease example. This is the underside of the leaf. And that's the top surface of the leaf. And then here's just some fruit with some scab markings on it. So again, if you know specifically what it is, um, you can write it down, or if you just want to say fungal, bacterial, or viral. So good, all bacterial coming in. Okay, very good. So this is bacterial leaf spot on pepper. It is a bacterial disease um, that causes these water-soaked lesions with a yellow halo and scabs on the fruit. It prefers hot, wet weather. Um, it can survive on the seed and, and on crop debris, and therefore it's important uh, to buy disease-free seeds or transplants. You can plant resistant varieties. Um, if you do have bacterial leaf spot, you're going to want to also control any potential weed hosts like nightshades that you have in the area. Um, as I mentioned, this can overwinter in the seeds as well as plant debris, so you're going to want to clean any debris um, and then also rotate away if at all possible from the site for the following year. Okay, I'm now going to go into insect identification and I'm going to throw, show you three ways that hopefully will help you narrow down your insects. Um, this is based on the type of insect that you're looking at, the feeding damage that you're observing, and the host crop. So we're going to start with the type of insect, beginning with um, beetles. This is kind of a generic beetle. These go through complete metamorphosis, meaning they go from a larval stage into a pupal stage and then into the adult, um, whereas where the immature and the adult look very different from each other. Um, so this is kind of your generic beetle. Uh, as with all insects, they have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, and six legs. The immature, same. They also have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen with six legs. Um, for beetles, both the adult and the larvae can be pests, so you could have some larvae feeding on roots. Um, they also feed on the leaves. The adults are mainly found on the leaves, and they have mandibles, so they cause this chewing damage, so they're going to chew into the leaf or chew into the root. Uh, caterpillars, these are the immatures of moths and butterflies, also have complete metamorphosis, so the immature looks very different from the adult. Again, they have um, three pairs of legs, but the caterpillars will also have these prolegs, so you can kind of differentiate them from, from beetles based on these prolegs. The larvae are the ones that are going to be the pests, not the adults. Um, they usually cause chewing damage on the leaves, but there's also some borers or miners. So you're gonna see either boring damage or mining damage, boring in the stem or mining kind of in between the leaf surface. And I'm gonna show you examples of all the damage in a little bit. Um, these are the grasshoppers. These have incomplete metamorphosis. So you can see the immatures look very similar to the adult. They don't go through this pupil stage and the immatures as well the, as the adults can be pests. Um, they also have mandibles, so you're gonna be looking for chewing damage for the grasshoppers. So the next one is the maggots. These are the immature flies. Again, complete metamorphosis. The immature looks very different from the adult and they go through this pupil stage. It's the larvae that's usually the pest um, and they also cause chewing damage on the roots and seeds, but they can also be miners between the leaf surface. Thrips, um, they go through incomplete metamorphosis. The immatures look very similar to the adults. All the stages can be a pest and they feed by rasping. So they cause this rasping damage where they scrape away at the leaf and then they feed on the fluids that come out of the wound that they created. These are mites. Um, these are not insects. They're often kind of grouped in with the insects, but they're not. They only have two body parts and then they'll have eight legs. The larvae, which isn't pictured here, would have six legs, but you could still distinguish them from insects because they only have two body parts. Um, all the different stages can be a pest and they cause sucking damage on the, on the plant. Um, so my last group, I'm just gonna kind of group these all together because they're very similar. Aphids, bugs, which includes the stink bugs and hoppers. All three of these have incomplete metamorphosis. 
So the immatures look very similar to the adults. Um, all the stages can be a pest and they have piercing sucking mouth parts. So they cause sucking damage to the, to the host crop. Um, one way for aphids, an easy way to distinguish aphids is they have these cornicles, these projections on their abdomen. Um, some people call them, I think, tailpipes, but they have these projections on their abdomen and they also secrete honeydew. So another thing, if, if you think you might have aphid damage is to look for honeydew. Often you'll see kind of a sticky substance on the leaf. And if you look up above that leaf, there might be aphids there that are secreting this honeydew. Okay, so those are the main insect types. I'm now gonna go through the different kinds of feeding damage, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, so rasping, chewing, mining, boring, and sucking. So if looking at this first picture, do you, what kind of damage do you think that is? Is that rasping damage, chewing damage, mining, boring, or sucking damage? If you have any ideas, you can just write it down in the chat. And Mary, and you're at you're about five minutes or so before we'll uh, just start taking questions. Okay, I'm gonna boot me off. <laughs> no rush, we just don't want, we're gonna just get Dan in around 9.30, so it's not a rush. Okay, okay. All right, everybody got this one right. Chewing, 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 great, perfect, thank you. Um, so yes, this is chewing damage. This is caused by the imported cabbage worm. You can actually see one laying here. They, it's sometimes very hard to find these because they blend in so well, um, almost the same color as the leaf. And then they cause these large piles of frass on the leaf. So this is chewing damage. Um, what about this one? Again, chewing, rasping, mining, boring, or sucking. Oh, very good. Everyone's writing down boring damage. Yes, this is boring damage caused by the squash vine borer. So they'll lay their eggs, they go in here and bore. Um, very difficult to control these once they're inside the stem, mainly with any kind of um, pesticides. Uh, so this is our next type of damage. What what do you think this one is? Okay, most people wrote leaf mining. Very good. It, it is leaf mining. Uh, one sucking. I can kind of see why you might think it's sucking. Sometimes when they start mining, the mines will actually turn into one large um, opening. They've mined so much, but usually you kind of just see like these squiggly lines. And if you hold the leaf up to the light, you can often see the larvae in there. So this is spinach leaf miner, mining in a spinach leaf. So what about this one? This is a tricky one. Um, if you look over here, this might give you an idea. This is, the, this is the culprit. So if you know what that is, that might give you an idea of what kind of damage that is. Yes, so someone put scraping, rasping. Yes, rasping damage. So this is a thrips. Um, it's kind of scraped away at the leaf and then it feeds on the fluids that come out. Um, so my last one, um, the only one really left, but it causes a lot of different kinds of damage. That's why I can see both the rasping and the mining can look very similar to this last one, which of course is our sucking damage. Um, depending on what the insect is, the symptoms can look different. The first one is aphids. Aphids often feed on the underside of the leaf and they'll cause the leaves to kind of cup like this sometimes. Um, these are spider mites also sucking, but they'll cause a stippling appearance. To the leaf. And then this last one is squash bugs, which will also suck and they cause the leaves to wilt and eventually they turn a yellow and brown color. So sucking damage can be variable. It's, this one's probably the hardest to identify that it's sucking. Okay, so the last thing to know as you're narrowing down your possible insect pests is what the host crop is. Some insects like grasshoppers will feed on many different hosts, but others are very host specific and might only feed on a closely related plant, like uh, for example, the squash vine borer. So if you have a pest, <clears throat> sorry, and you think you know what it is, be sure that the pest is known to feed on that host. Also keep in mind um, potential weed hosts that might be nearby that the pest could be feeding on. So we're now gonna go through a couple examples of insects. Um, 
So again, looking at this damage, think about what you think might be causing this kind of damage. Is this um, chewing damage, mining, sucking, rasping, boring? And if you're doing a good job scouting, you would probably flip over some leaves too, and you might find a cluster of these. So there's some eggs. These all often help you identify stuff if, if you can find some eggs. So if anybody has any guesses, you guys can write it down. The next one is probably gonna give it away a little bit. So if you keep looking or you come back the next week and these eggs have hatched because you forgot to remove them, um, you might find some of these. So you look at these, you see some immatures and some adults. So they look very similar. So this is the squash bug. They resemble a stink bug, but are a bit more narrow in shape. And they lay these clusters of orange to brown eggs, usually on the underside of the leaf. The adults can overwinter in debris. Um, some management options are to hand remove any eggs, nymphs, or adults that you find. Um, and then also remove any overwintering sites, such as logs or boards that you might have laying around because they'll overwinter under those. We're going to go into um, our next pest. So this is the damage you see. Chewing, sucking, mining, rasping, boring. So this is a, oh good, people have chewing, very good. So if you were, again, you're scouting well, you might, these are hard because they lay them individually, you might not find these, but. So there's an egg. It's easier when eggs are laid in clusters. <laughs> and then again, the final picture is gonna give it away. So we find these big fat larvae here and you might see some of these flying around in your field. So this is the imported cabbage worm. It causes these large holes in the leaves um, on many different crucifers, uh, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower. And they also, from the previous picture that I showed, they also cause a lot of frass. The pupae will overwinter in crop debris. Um, and to manage for this pest, you're gonna to wanna to control any weed hosts, um, the brassicas, the mustards, uh, plant early and use rope cover to kind of prevent the um, moth, the butterfly from flying in and laying eggs. If you do find any eggs or larvae, you can hand remove those. Um, you can also encourage beneficials such as lace wings and parasitic wasps. And we're gonna have another talk coming up later today on ways that you're gonna be able to encourage beneficials in your garden. So that's the last insect pest. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'm actually yeah. done. I just have two quick Zoom polling questions just to see if any of these tools that you learned um, if you think you feel a little more comfortable when you're going to go out there and identify your insects and diseases. So these are the exact same questions. Um, find them first. So again, for the insects, how comfortable are you? Do you think you have a little bit more knowledge now or a few more tools that you can use to try to identify things? All right, I'll end the poll and I'll share the results. I hope they're, sh they're sharing so good. I think it's moved up a little bit, which is good. Um, hopefully people feel more comfortable. And we're gonna do the next one. Um, okay, so this one is now just for diseases. Any more comfortable trying to identify diseases or do you think you have a few more tools available now? Okay, and I'll share the results. So again, it looks like people feel a little bit more comfortable, which is good to know. Um, so yeah, I hope it was helpful. Uh, if there's any questions, please write them in the chat and I will answer them. Um, and keep in mind your local CCE office or IPM, if you have any pest issues, if you have any questions, please contact us. Thanks, Miriam.